Hello and welcome to JavaScript Marathon, a full day of free online courses in some of the leading web development technologies and concepts. I'm Sarah Renault with this.labs and I will be your marathon host. Before we get started, we wanted to send a big shout out to our sponsor today, SyncFusion. If you are looking for a UI component suite, you should check out their Essential Studio platform. It includes over 16,000 components that were built from scratch with performance in mind. They're lightweight and modular. The platform is really user-friendly and devs find it quick to learn. It offers pixel-perfect built-in themes that are available in material, bootstrap, and fabric designs, and an accessible high-contrast theme. Which, speaking of accessibility, all Sync Fusion controls are touch-friendly and render across desktops, phones, and tablets, which makes it a great tool for those using adaptive technologies. So if you want to make your devs' lives easier and you're working with JavaScript, JS Frameworks, ASP.NET, Flutter, Blazor, just to name a few, I definitely recommend checking out SyncFusion by visiting syncfusion.com. We have a ton of upcoming events. State of Angular is live next week, Thursday, April 1st. We have GraphQL Contributor Days coming up on April 13th. And Modern Web State of Application Monitoring is live April 20th. Our monthly mentoring for women in tech returns on April 21st. For more information, subscribe to our newsletter, The Load Down, for weekly updates, or follow us on Twitter at this.labs. JavaScript Marathon is back in May. We have another round of incredible sessions with experts in the dev community coming back on May 19th. Stay tuned for updates at javascriptmarathon.com. Our next session fe features Nick Steenhout. Welcome, Nick, to JavaScript Marathon. Yeah, hi. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and hopefully it's going to be as fun as I think it's going to be. I think so, too. Nicholas Steenhout is an independent accessibility consultant. He will be presenting developing accessible websites and web-based apps with JavaScript. You can find Nick on Twitter at Vavroom. And with that, I'm going to let you take it over, Nick. Hello, everyone. Um, so the first thing I want to say is that this is really a, an introduction to accessibility, an introduction to some of the things you can do with JavaScript and some of the caveats that we need to, to keep in mind when we're doing that. To get you started on this accessibility journey, I want to tell you a story. A story about me going down the sidewalk about two years ago. My uh, service dog was pulling me. It was sunny, and I had dark wraparound sunglasses. As I came by uh, a patio, an outdoor terrace, there were a couple people talking together. And one said to the other, oh, isn't it sad? He's blind and in a wheelchair. So I stopped, turned around, and I said, yeah, 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 but I'm not deaf. The thing is. Most people seeing a service dog assume it's a guide dog because we don't know that there's different types of service dog than guide dogs, especially with the dark glasses I had on. It's it's an easy mistake to make when we're not familiar with disability, with service dogs, with all the wonderful things uh, service dogs can do for us, whether it's a hearing dog, a seizure dog, a guide dog, a mobility assistance dog. So when you're going on your accessibility journey, keep in mind that there are things you know that you don't know, and there's things that you don't even know that you don't know, and, and this is okay. The, uh, the learning about accessibility is a process. Uh, you're not going to wake up tomorrow and know everything about it. If, if you do, just let me know how you did it, because that would be a wonderful thing to know. Um, so a bit of background on me. I've been doing accessibility for well over 20 years. Um, I've been around the block a few times. I've done a lot of work in open source. I was uh, part of the core development team of Joomla. I've worked with WordPress. And for the last 15 years or so, I've been uh, doing accessibility consultation with large and small organization, uh, typically auditing and a lot of training and a lot of planning, strategic planning. Uh, I run a podcast, strangely enough, about accessibility, and that's at a11yrules.com. 
It's accessibility rules. I'm on Twitter a lot, and I invite anyone who has questions after the session to send them at me, and I'll be happy to answer later on. Um, but first, let's talk about accessibility. Um, A11Y. Uh, you probably have seen that uh, mostly as a hashtag, sometimes in uh, domains and, and site name. And if you don't know why A11Y or Ally stands for accessibility, it's because it's a numeronym. So we take the first, um, the first letter and the last letter, and then we count the number of letters in between, and there's 11. So we have A11Y for accessibility. Uh, I've heard it say that A11Y is not very accessible, um, which is a fair comment, but it's also going back to the days of Twitter when we had 140 characters to say what we had to say. Um, and it's it's kind of like grown and it's mostly adopted now. So we're talking about accessibility, but when we write about it, we'll see it um, shortened very often. Accessibility is good for everyone, um, but primarily we're looking at focusing accessibility on four primary groups of people. Uh, first is people with hearing impairments, whether someone is deaf or hard of hearing, uh, there's a series of things we want to consider when we're doing um, accessibility. We're also talking about people with visual impairments, whether they are blind or have low vision or any range in between. Uh, we're talking about people with mobility impairments. So uh, maybe somebody is paralyzed after a um, football injury or you know they had a stroke or any number of things. They may not be able to uh, control a mouse easily or they may have tremors. That means that uh, fine motor control is really difficult. And the, the final group we're talking about people with cognitive impairments, whether it's learning disabilities or dyslexia or dyscalculia, or maybe it's a traumatic brain injury. Maybe that kid that uh, got injured playing football didn't get paralyzed, but they may have lifelong problems with concentration, with migraines, with uh, memory issues. So there, there's a whole range of things that impact uh, their ability to interact with the web. We're also talking about every device, uh, whether it's on a phone, on a tablet, on a desktop, but also on other devices that maybe you and I are not as used to uh, seeing. Uh, folks who are blind often use a uh, Braille touch device, which is like a small computer, like a laptop, but it doesn't have a screen and uh, either the output is through audio or through a, a strip of refresh, refreshable Braille uh, dots. Um, th there's a whole range. There's even people that surf the web on their TV and they may have accessibility issues there. So we want to keep in mind that when we build things, they're not all going to be on desktop with a 800 uh, gigabyte connection on a nice color calibrated screen and all that. We're, we're not developing things for ourselves. We're developing things for people. And I guarantee you that they're going to use and access your, your assets, your websites, your applications in ways you never considered before. A large part of accessibility is making sure that build works for assistive technologies. Um, and perhaps the one you've heard most about is screen readers. Screen readers are complex applications for uh, people with vision issues primarily. Uh, and, and as the name implies, it reads what's on the screen. It does a lot more than that, though. It, it allows interaction with the entire computer, whether it's, it's logging in, it's uh, booting up software, creating new documents, interacting with forms. It's a whole range of, it's a tool that allows people with disabilities to use uh, computers. Uh, more and more people with dyslexia are relying on screen readers, so that's a, a different dynamic when you can see the screen, but you're interacting with the screen reader to it. So that creates another layers of, of having to consider how are we doing these things. Um, we have the keyboard. 
It's probably the one assistive technology that you are familiar with that you use every day. Uh, it started, the first keyboard was in, 19, uh, in 1850. Uh, in the 50, 1850s, someone who uh, was the director of a school for deaf folks wanted to create a method for them to communicate with hearing people as quickly as hearing people could communicate. So that was the first iteration of a keyboard. And since then and now, there's been about 50 uh, different format until we have the keyboard we know and love and sometimes hate as well. Um, we're also talking about um, speech input, things like Dragon Naturally Speaking. You may have heard, if you heard a squeak, that was my dog that stretched and caught a hair. So he's all right. But um, Dragon Naturally Speaking is a, um, a speech input software. Uh, it does more than just we talk, it types. It's a control and command the computer again. We're talking about being able to open applications, create documents, interact with the whole computer if you don't have use of your arms. Uh, we're talking about sip and puff switches, so a uh, method of controlling computer by puffing or sipping in, in certain uh, patterns in uh, straws connected to a, a computer switch. We're talking about eye tracking. So you may have a camera mounted on top of your monitor and depending on where you're looking on the screen, it will know what you want to do. If you blink your eyes, you might use that as a click on an interactive element or you may be able to control um, online uh, on-screen keyboard. So th there's a whole range of ways people interact with our applications, our websites that we have to kind of think about. And we're not expert in all these things. So what we have to take it back to is coding to the standards, coding to semantic HTML, and trying to keep in mind a few things that we're gonna talk about during, uh, during the rest of this presentation. I should say that people are by far the largest minority on the web. Uh, if we were in person, I would take a few minutes and ask you how many people do you think have disabilities uh, in North America? And, but we're not in person, so we don't have that. So I'm going to give you the answer. The latest report from the CDC counts 26% of people with disabilities, with a significant disability in the United States right now. That's one in four person. That's a lot of people. Does that mean everybody on the web right now that has a disability experiences barriers? The answer to that is no. Um, there's probably not 26% of people on the web right now that have disabilities that have barriers. We, we won't argue that. But we don't have metrics. We don't know who comes to our website with screen reader. We don't know who comes to our website uh, resizing their, their browser window. We don't know who uses only a keyboard. We don't know these things. So the question we ask ourselves is, why should we spend time making our apps app or our application or our web pages accessible since we actually don't know? Typically, I ask people this, what's the oldest browser you support and what's the percentage of people coming to your website with that browser? And the answer is often IE 11 and less than 1%. I guarantee you, even though there may not be 26% of people that have accessibility barriers on your website, there will be a lot more than 1%. So we don't know the numbers, but we do know that they're significant enough to make a difference. And besides that, it's the right thing to do. It's also probably a legal requirement for your clients to have an accessible website. But online barriers aren't just for people with disabilities. Uh, one of the things we talk about a lot is making sure that our sites have sufficient contrast so that the foreground contrasts well with the background. And we're talking typically for regular text, a contrast ratio of 4.5 to 1. That means gray text on gray background is a no-no. 
That's really important for people with vision impairments. It's also very important for us when we're looking at our web uh, at our website on our phone outside in bright sunlight. If the contrast is not sufficient, we're going to have a problem finding it. Uh, we're talking about making sure that we create enough uh, target space for checkboxes because people with tremors might have difficulty tapping, uh, tapping it. It's the same thing if you're trying to fill out a form, you're in the bus or in a subway, and everything's moving, and the target is tiny, and you're trying to tap it is going to be difficult. So accessibility really is good for everyone. But let's talk a little bit about JavaScript, because this is JavaScript Marathon, so we want to, to talk more. We, we've got a brief overview about who it's important for, why it's important. Let's look at um, a few things around JavaScript. A long, long time ago, and maybe you weren't there then, a long, long time ago, we used to um, say that JavaScript actually was not good for accessibility. In fact, a lot of the audits we were doing, the first thing we'd do is we'd turn off JavaScript and see if we could work the website. And if we couldn't, we'd say, hey, we are not going to even go further than that because your site relies on JavaScript and it's borked. It's not working. The fact is, today, 97% of screen readers actually support JavaScript. And this, this is done through a survey of, um, of screen reader users that's actually quite, um, quite important. It's run every 18 months, two years, something like that. So we have up to 97% of people uh, with disabilities using assistive technologies, particularly screen readers, that are quote unquote JavaScript enabled. This means we can actually use JavaScript to increase accessibility. We have to think a little bit about what we're going to do, how we're going to do it. But uh, we can provide uh, additional information. We can provide warning for timed responses. We can provide additional time instructions. So we can do a whole range of things that provide more information that control how the interface um, reacts and behaves in ways that are going to be more accessible. Uh, th this is really, uh, really cool, I think. Some of the things we can uh, do is we can have progress bar. But when we're doing a progress bar, we have to make sure we're indicating the progress in text. Um, and, and this is where JavaScript becomes interesting, because we can refresh the data fairly easily. So as the, as the progress bar progresses, we can also change the uh, the data. So it can be 25% uh, or 50%, and as it moves, 60%. So that's going to provide information in a text-based format that is available for screen readers to, to actually know what the process is. Um, we have to think about focus management. So when we're doing things like dynamic content, expand and collapse, or maybe we're we're using um, SPAs, single page applications, where a lot of the interaction is driven by uh, by JavaScript, we also want to use JavaScript to manage where the focus goes. Because sometimes we place the focus in one spot visually, but the actual text focus is somewhere else entirely. So the experience becomes a little bit strange, especially if you're sighted and you rely on screen readers, then you don't know what's happening because you're seeing one thing, but the text announce is very, very different. Now, one of the things that um, is very important is around keyboard navigation. and a lot of us developers are power keyboard users. We use the keyboard extensively when we're coding, when we're developing. But when we start using the web, we revert to using uh, a mouse. And keyboard navigation is super important for a whole range of people, 
including screen reader users, including people that may have tremors or prefer to use a keyboard because it's it's faster or less painful. Uh, maybe you have RSI, you have problems with your thumb because you've used a mouse too much. Um, so there, there's a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, probably you know that to move forward on a page, you use the tab key. To go backwards on a page, you use the shift tab to trigger interactive elements, uh, whether it's a button or a form or checkbox, you would use either the enter key or the space bar. And I have a challenge for you. Uh, probably not today, because today is a whole day of sessions and marathon and all that. But tomorrow, spend an hour surfing the web without your trackpad, without your mouse, using just a keyboard. And once you've done that, come back and tell me on Twitter, how was the experience? Were you able to get through all the elements? Were you able to actually see where your focus was everywhere? Were you able to just function relatively easily without frustration, without wanting to throw your laptop out the window? And if the answer is no, which it likely isn't, then think about what you can do as a developer to make that keyboard experience better. Um, some of the things we want to look at is making sure we're using elements that have native focus, uh, so focusable elements, things like links, buttons, form elements, iframes. Uh, there, there's a long list of them on the, the allyjs.io, uh, there's a link on the slide. Um, so we want really to make sure we use these native HTML semantically meaningful elements. Uh, unfortunately, we have a lot of framework, whether it's React or Angular or Vue or the flavor of the month, that actually will create elements using divs or spans or the I element, or any number of basically semantically non-meaningful elements that we have to actually build to, um, to make it work. So where am I going with this? Well, the first thing is wherever possible, we use native element. But sometimes we don't have a choice. And sometimes we need to be able to provide focus to keyboard users, and sometimes we need to be able to put programmatic focus on something. So um, providing keyboard access uh, means if you use a div instead of a link and you're coding it to behave like a link, one of the things you need to do is you need to make it keyboard focusable. To do that, you would add the tab index attribute and you would put a value of zero on the element. This is super important. Don't build fake buttons or fake links or fake interactive elements without making them focusable, because otherwise nobody will relies on a keyboard, on a switch, on a screen reader, on speech input. Nobody will be able to interact with your element. The other time is, as I said, when we're focusing, uh, managing focus in SPAs or dynamic content or all that, we need to be able to, using JavaScript, put programmatic focus on an element. And in order of uh, making that element focusable programmatically, again, we use the tab index attribute and we give it the value of minus one. So those are the two values what you want to use, either zero for keyboard or minus one for programmatic focus. If there's one thing you remember from this presentation is do not use positive tab index. Don't use tab index one or two or three or God forbid, like I found on another last year, tab index 4,317. Uh, because what happens when you do that is you mess with the natural um, tab order on the page and when you start doing that, you need to actually apply a tab index to every single element to give them the order and force that specific order. And that can create 
a very frustrating experience for uh, assistive technology users and keyboard users, but it's also extremely difficult to get right. It's so easy to forget or skip one, or maybe in six months there's an update to the page and the update rewrites something and it breaks everything. So don't ever use positive tab indexes anywhere. Um, you may think it's good, think again, it's not. Um, one of the things we can use JavaScript with is to improve the accessibility of modal windows. Uh, we don't have a lot of time, so I can't give you a live demo, but I do have a code pen linked from the slide that actually demonstrates that. But um, some of the things we have to think about with modal windows, modal dialogues, is they don't typically appear in the uh, normal tab order. So we make them appear or disappear uh, depending on what happens with uh, user interactions. It must capture the keyboard until the dialogue is dismissed by the user. This is important because if you're uh, using the, the tab on your um, keyboard and you tab out of the modal window, then you are interacting with the content behind the modal window on the page underneath. And coming back to the modal is really difficult. So uh, it's especially tricky for sighted keyboard users. It's also tricky for um, uh, screen reader users. Uh, when the modal opens, you want to set focus on the heading. And you want to be able to close it with either the Escape key or uh, close button. So there's there's a few things to, to think about. For example, you would create an event listener for the escape key. So on key press, uh, when it's escape, you close the modal. Which brings me to this idea of event handlers. Uh, we have two primary types of event handlers. Uh, the, the picky around you might argue that, but basically we have uh, device dependent. So something happens when you're interacting with a mouse or you're interacting with a keyboard. And then you have device independent handlers, uh, which work with mouse and keyboard and whatever other means, whether it's speech input or sip and puff. And this, this is important to think about because when you're creating device dependent handlers, then you have to think and do the heavy lifting twice. So wherever possible, use device independent uh, event handler like that. You will make your applications, your websites a lot more friendly to people that interact with it in many different and wonderful ways. Sometimes you're going to have some events that you don't have a choice. They there is no equivalent of things that do independence. So you would have to pair the, the closest uh, event handler possible. So for example, you would pair on mouse down with on key down, and you would make your code work with both those events. Uh, this, this becomes important because if you're doing something for mouse only, then you're excluding all the keyboard only users. And if you're thinking, oh, well, I'm going to make this accessible for keyboard users, but then it doesn't work for mouse users, then it's it's a little bit of a problem there. Um, as you're looking at these events and, and everything like that, think about the purpose of what you want to do, not the mechanics. It doesn't matter if two different people approaching your site from two different devices and in two different needs of excessive uh, access assistive technologies it doesn't matter if the method is slightly different as long as the purpose as long as they're able to complete whatever it is that they need to do whether it's signing up for a product or getting information or reading a tutorial or whichever it is think about the purpose rather than the mechanics of the action One of the things you want to avoid is modifying default behavior. Um, we do that, we have to do that when we're making a div behave like a button. 
Um, so we're going to modify the default behavior because basically a, a, a div does not have a default behavior. It's inert. So we have to build it. We have to give it a role. We have to give it a tab index. We have to give it all kinds of things to, to make it behave like a button would. So we can do that. And sometimes we do that on elements that aren't like this. So for example, maybe we uh, create an heading and we want it to behave like a button. So we will start marking it up like H2 with a roll of button and a tab index and all the things that make it behave like a button. And suddenly, when you're a screen reader user, when you rely on assistive technology, you get to that H2 and you're getting conflicting information. Is it a heading or is it a button and what's happening? You're much better to use semantically meaningful HTML. So you would put an H2 and nest a button in it. You still got what you need to do to get it done, but semantically it makes sense. And if for whatever reason your JavaScript isn't loading, then you know it's still going to work. Um, dynamic content. Um, some of the things we do a lot, whether it's expand and collapse, whether it's uh, search results, whether it's any kind of content manipulation that is dynamic on the page. Going back to this, you've heard it, me talk about keyboard a few times. So the question is, can you trigger the content with a keyboard. So can you expand and collapse only using the keyboard? And is the content that you're delivering dynamically, is that one itself accessible? Because often it's not. So we, we have to make sure that all the layers of what we're creating is accessible. Now, some of you probably have heard of why ARIA and uh, if you haven't, you probably have been living under a rock or you've been using it without realizing it's called Y area. And the reason it's called Y area is because it is put together by the Web Accessibility Initiative. Uh, that's a branch of the W3C. And area stands for Accessible Rich Internet Application. Uh, it's a technical spec. It's available online. Uh, you can look it up. It's actually a fascinating read if you're into standards. Um, and it came out before HTML5. It is a series of elements that allow you to uh, make things more accessible. Now, in HTML5, a lot of what we created uh, in area actually became superfluous because HTML5 took a lot of, of these ideas in. Um, with that in mind, I would ask you, but it's a bit difficult, but um, think for a second, what do you think the first rule of area is? This is actually quite important. We, we can recreate a lot of behavior, change behavior. We can do a whole lot of things with area that really we shouldn't do. There was a report a couple of years ago uh, put by a, an organization called WebAIM, and it's the Million Accessible Website Report. And what they did is they crawled the homepage of the first one million result on Google. And once they had that, they did an automated test for accessibility on that. And one of the things they realized is that when you had area on a page, the page was 61% more likely to be having accessibility problems. So here's a technology developed specifically for accessibility, which over the years has been used in such a way that it actually causes accessibility issues. So in general, don't sprinkle area everywhere uh, just to make it more accessible. Think about what you do. Um, some of it really comes back down to semantic. No HTML. There's, um, there's this saying that's going around in the accessibility community that a four-year-old knows about 300 words in their 
maternal language. There's not even 200 important HTML tags. So no HTML, at least as well as a toddler knows their maternal language. That's, that's really a basic skill. And when you start with that, then you understand the semantics and you understand how to use the different elements. A button is a button, a div is a div. Why use a div instead of a button when you can use a button and you get all the heavy lifting of accessibility for free? It's all built in. Um, there's another code pen that um, you can have a look at later on. It's at bit.ly forward slash button hyphen div. And it shows you the, the difference between using a div, using a button, and, and all the things you need to do to make a div behave exactly like a button. You need about 80% more code than uh, more, more markup to do that just from the HTML perspective. So that means that using semantically meaningful HTML is good for accessibility. It's also good for performance. You can shave maybe 60, maybe 70% of your pages just by using semantically meaningful HTML. I think that's a win. Um, but that said, we have we have ways, uh, we have reasons to use area to improve accessibility. And some of these things are to define roles. For example, if you have a search form, you can give it a role of search, and then suddenly that information will be accessible to screen reader users who are looking at the different form on a site, on a page. They will immediately know, oh, this form is a search form. Um, if you're using tooltips, you can give it a role, uh, give a give a role of tooltip. Again, that's going to impart semantically important information. Um, you can use role of alerts or role of slider. The the uh, slider we had early on with the uh, the uh, the green bar. Uh, we can use area to inform that equivalent in text. So there there's a whole bunch of roles we can apply. Uh, we can rule button, rule heading, rule, there's a whole lot. Um, area is also giving properties and states to element. Uh, for example, if you have an input, you can define area required uh, attribute and say whether it's true or false. So you can use that. Uh, now, in HTML5, we have the required attribute. So some people say just use required attribute. You don't need area required. Unfortunately, browsers and uh, screen reader uh, technologies, the way these things have been implemented, especially around uh, form validation, it can have an impact. In this case, using the area required attribute actually is better. Um, we can associate um, error messages with inputs using the area described by attribute, and then we use an ID of um, of whichever paragraph has the error message, uh, provided that we're using a um, a unique ID on that. Um, when we were talking about expand and co collapse content, we would put um, an area expanded attribute on the button that triggers that. So someone using a screen reader comes to that button, they immediately know whether there's extra content that can be expanded when uh, they activate the button. Um, we're able to hide specific things from assistive technologies using area hidden. Generally speaking, we don't want to do that. We want to provide the same content to sighted users and screen reader users. But there are some situations where this becomes actually uh, important. Um, and finally, we're talking about Area Live. You probably have seen that. You probably have used that. Um, and Area Live is providing what is called a live region. So when content changes in that block of content that has Area Live on it, it is announced by screen readers. Um, live regions are really really important for controlling dynamic content and, and letting screen reader users know something changed on their page. There's three values for it. There's area live off, 
So typically that's not used very much, but it's something you may want to use. We have Aria Live Assertive, which is used a lot, but is a problem. In general, you don't want to use Aria Live Assertive because it interrupts anything the screen reader is doing to announce whatever it is that's changed. So one of the ways I've seen it used a lot is in, um, in forms for validation, especially when you're doing inline validation, you check that the RMS, the, the email address is correct. And every time there's going to be a, a check on that until the email is properly formed, you're saying, well, this, this is not correct. So Aralev Assertive would interrupt the user typing in every single letter they, they put in. So you're much better to use Aralev is polite. This is really um, the best approach when you're looking at that. So let's open it up for questions for anything else at this point. This was a whirlwind presentation to give you a few ideas of things to consider and think about. So any questions out there? Thank you, Nick. This was an awesome presentation. We do have a couple questions. Let's get to the first one. Uh, Blue Super Giants, are there automated tools to utilize positive tab index? Would such a tool make tab index attribute better? Um, I'm not sure I understand the question about automated tools to use positive tab index, but really what it comes down to is don't use positive tab index. Just don't do it. It's, it's really creating a mess for a whole bunch of users, particularly those who rely on keyboard. So just don't use positive tab index. That's very good advice. Um, our next question comes from Amy. So if there's a semantic meaning or default behavior, don't add your own behavior as clarifying that, question. That's correct. So if, if you're using an element that have built-in semantic uh, meaning, whether it's a, a button, a link, an input, a heading, or any of these fairly typical HTML element, you do not want to add your own behavior to that because mm -hmm. uh, because as an assistive technology user coming to the element, you expect a certain behavior. So you come to a table, and you're going to be told, hey, there's a table, there's seven columns, there's 15 rows, and you're going to expect a certain way to interact with this table. If you're changing the behavior of that, for example, you're using the table for layout instead of using it for a tabular data, then all that expectation is changed and you've increased the cognitive load of the user. It's making the page harder to use. Good advice. Uh, another question from Amy. Would you say that an auto suggest component that changes the number of elements that match based on text input would be a good use of assertive or would you still use polite? I would still use polite because the assertive value of the uh, live region really means that the screen reader is going to interrupt what it's doing. So imagine someone is typing in your search box and the screen reader is giving feedback about what is being typed. So maybe I'm typing dog, but instead of dog, I wrote God. Um, it's important for me as a screen reader user who can't see what's going on on the screen to get that feedback from, from, my, uh, from my technology. If the developer uses assertive, it's going to interrupt with every single key press what's going on. So suddenly it becomes difficult to know what you've typed. Um, if you're using polite, it's going to wait until the, the user has finished. So maybe they'll type one letter at a time, wait to see what is being uh, exposed in your search results or autocomplete, but maybe they just want to type the whole thing, uh, the whole word really quickly. Uh, you don't know what that's going to be. As a rule, it's rather rude to interrupt people. And I know a lot of blind screen reader users that say the same thing. Don't interrupt my assistive technology because it throws me off my pace. That makes sense. Great. 
Um, I think that's all the questions that we have at this time. But if anyone is watching this in replay or you have any further questions, we did drop Nick's Twitter handle in the chat. So go ahead and follow him. Let's continue the conversation there. Also, challenge everyone to do the keyboard challenge. So um, try to navigate the web using keyboard only. And let's talk to Nick about it on Twitter. Um, again, I also dropped all of those code pen um, links in the chat as well. So if you have any other questions with that, um, just keep the conversation going here or on Twitter. And we're so happy that everyone came. Um, also, we wanted to shout out from the chat that Nick's jacket is exquisite. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. I have to second that. Your, your jacket is exquisite. Um, thank you so much, Nick, for being a part of JavaScript Marathon. We really yeah. loved having you. Um, we thank will you. be back. So we're coming back with Dustin Goodman. He's going to do a presentation on REST to GraphQL, so don't miss it. Come back soon. Um, we will be back soon. Have a great day, everyone. We'll see y'all soon. Cheers. Bye, everyone.